Okay, we're uh, we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get started here. So thank you everybody for attending today's webinar, uh, where we're gonna discuss protecting commercial properties from pest pressures during COVID nineteen. Uh, I'm Shane Hartnett, a regional manager for Sprague Pest Solutions. Uh, I've worked in the pest industry for a little over thirteen years. Um, I've worked for Sprague that whole time here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them. Uh, down at the bottom in the Q&A function, and we'll get to all those and answer them at the end of the webinar. Um, and there is a, re a recording of this uh, that will be available afterwards as well. Uh, so just a little bit about a little bit about Sprague. Um, we have been solving. Uh, we've been doing commercial pest control for over uh, 95 years here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and uh, we are headquartered down in Tacoma. And Sprague, really, we, we believe in the work that the world deserves to eat safer food and live and work in healthier environments. And, and today we're going to be covering commercial properties um, that really are at the center of safe food and workplaces in our communities. For, for the purpose of our call today, we're going to define commercial properties uh, simply as buildings that house other businesses. And, and in terms of pest control, they can be anything from warehouses and industrial space to malls, which you know, lease restaurants and retailers to office space and really anything in between. Uh, today, we're joined by Dr. Richard Hausman. And uh, Dr. Hausman, uh, please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Dr. Richard Hausman. I've been with Sprague um, since the summer of 2020. Prior to that, I was a professor of entomology at the University of Missouri for 17 years. Uh, I got my PhD from Texas A&M, working with insects associated with human environments. And uh, in, indoor environments are an important part of each of our daily lives. If you look at this graphic, it shows what proportion of time we spend in different parts of the environment we're in, whether it's indoors or outdoors. And if, you, if we were to look at this graph more closely, we would see that we spend 90% of our time indoors in some sort of an indoor environment that's controlled for temperature and it keeps us dry. And we often provision food and resources we need there. And so these indoor environments are really important to us. Uh, Sometimes they're called sacred spaces, uh, which is which kind of emphasizes that they are locations where we feel stable and where we're linked to emotionally. That feeling when we come home after being gone for a while is a, a feeling of that we've entered a space that's unique. The walls of our of our indoor environments delineate this space, and we have laws that protect it. We have doorways that cover it, and and entrance into these spaces, uh, these indoor spaces, are usually only given by permission. And uh, so these are real important spaces, whether it's in our homes or whether it's in our businesses or other indoor spaces. Unfortunately, there are other organisms that also look at our indoor spaces as an opportunity to live and gain access to resources. These are called synanthropic organisms. They live near us, they benefit from us. And uh, some of them are required to live in these indoor spaces with us. They can't live anywhere else. Then there are others that take advantage of it when they can, and so they can move between our environment and other environments and do it in a more facultative uh, way. But when they're in our environments, uh, there are many organisms that are considered pests because they influence us, they influence our health, the food we store there, our animals, maybe the structure itself is damaged. Um, and so these things become pests in, in some cases. And today I wanted to talk about um, a few primary groups of pests that have uh, this synanthropic association with us. And these associations have continued uh, during COVID, You've, despite the changes, uh, these organisms still are associated with these living spaces. And that's why 
uh, our industry is designated a critical industry that has been going and continues to serve and uh, provide these services during COVID-19. The first group I'll talk about are cockroaches. These uh, cockroaches are insects that uh, are primarily tropical. There are about 3,500 species in the world that live in tropical climates typically. So here in North America, we typically only see about 50 to 60 of those species and about 10 of those we would consider as pests. Of course, any unwanted organism in our home, despite the species would be considered a pest, but primarily about 55 of them will venture into our indoor spaces. Uh, cockroaches are known for having a high reproductive capacity. They develop and uh, they don't go through a pupil stage, so they are able to be active and eat in all stages of their life as they develop, as they scavenge on food and other resources inside of our structures. Um, they prefer warm, moist habitats. Obviously, they're more linked to tropical areas in general, and so the warm, moist spaces in our indoor environments are where they like to hang out. Some of these cockroaches only live indoors. There are a couple of species called the German cockroach and the brown banded cockroach that only live indoors and never venture out. But then you have other species that are shown here on in this slide, the large American Paraplanita americana roach or Blat Blata orientalis, the oriental cockroach that will move indoors and outdoors depending on the season and depending on the resources they need. Of course, cockroaches are important as pests in our environment because they move filth organisms, germs, and pathogens around. They visit unsanitary locations. Often these areas of moisture and food are, are areas where there's, there's an abundance of microorganisms and bacteria, and then they pick those up on their bodies and move to other places where they contaminate uh, surfaces, where they uh, may bring other kinds of allergens or uh, not just organisms, but other kinds of compounds that can be allergic compounds that we might react to in other ways. They can also, because they're generalist feeders, feed on things that are important to us, maybe damaging books, feeding on clothing in our closet, or they may uh, actually feed on furniture, especially furniture and clothing that have food stains on them. Cockroaches, I like to say, are not proud. They're just hungry and they'll eat almost anything. That means grease, garbage, feces, not just ours, but their own feces. They'll feed on sweets and other kinds of decay. When they feed, they don't just simply feed and swallow and have nice manners either. They're, they regurgitate that food as they're eating it. They spit it back out, re-eat it. They defecate, they deposit secretions from their body onto the surface where they're feeding. And this gives a characteristic cockroachy odor and this odor uh, is important, in, as we'll talk about in a minute, when it comes to human health. Uh, they like to, cockroaches like to hang out in what we call a harborage. These are small cracks and crevices or spaces in between cabinets and walls or between cabinets and, and uh, other objects. They, they will crawl under things, inside of things, where they can have the feeling that they're being touched both on the bottom of their bodies and on their backs. They have this flattened body that they can squeeze into these harborages and they prefer harborages that are near uh, moisture and warmth, uh, typically sinks, drains. So if you have bathrooms or other areas where there are water sources and there's a heat source, they prefer those areas. Uh, cockroaches, as I mentioned, as they eat, they regurgitate, they, they produce secretions and the volatiles from these activities that co go into the air um, can create a health risk. And specifically, uh, these allergens that are in these smells can, can uh, cause reactions, asthmatic responses in humans. And studies that have looked at this uh, compared areas with cockroach infestations to areas that are uninfested have found that asthma is much more common in areas where roaches are uh, living and and where they, uh, where they put off these, uh, these uh, volatile smells. Uh, one study found that uh, children uh, in areas with cockroach infestations in the inner city were three and a half times more likely to be hospitalized than other children. And so this is a real health risk that uh, in addition to the transporting and moving of microorganisms that cockroaches can, can bring. 
Another group of important pests are ants. Uh, all of us would recognize ants, they're social insects. Um, and so they often occur in large numbers. Uh, there are about 9,000 different species in the world, uh, a little over 500 different species in the United States, but about 50 or so that regularly enter our indoor spaces uninvited and create some sort of a situation, a pest situation. Of course, uh, because they're social insects, um, they can be a challenging pest. In addition, because they have such a varied diet and and they will go to a variety of different types of food, uh, they can be attracted into our indoor spaces readily. Uh, as far as being a pest in indoor environments, ants are typically a, a nuisance. Uh, they can contaminate our foods by getting into them and no one wants to obviously eat food that's been contaminated or items that have been contaminated with insects. But there are some ants even that will chew and cause damage to the wood or other parts of our structures, the cabinetry or other parts that are important. Um, in other situations, they may be ants that sting. Uh, they can, that can bite and, and cause some sort of a health risk, but uh, they will often damage turf by building mounds, defoliate plants. They may protect and defend other insects that are actually pests on plants and so, the house plants that we try to cultivate may be more likely to be infested when ants are protecting those, those insects that feed on them. Ants, of course, because of it being a serious pest and being one of the more difficult pests to manage, require consistent monitoring. There are a variety of different kinds of treatments for ants as they come indoors. And uh, as we'll learn in just a minute, ants indoors means there's a source outdoors. Uh, Ants typically choose their nest site based on instinct. So uh, you have some species that their instinct tells them to nest in soil and make a mound. Others whose instinct is to just find an empty space or a cavity space that's already formed and move in and make that the nest. Others yet will chew into wood and hollow out the inside so that that becomes their nest. Um, all ants go through, uh, utilize a strategy for taking care of the nest called age polyethism, which just simply means that as the, the worker ant gets older, it changes what it does in the colony. The youngest ones take care of the new eggs and the brood that the queen produces. The middle-aged workers take care of the nest itself, making new cavities, making new tunnels, cleaning out the old dead ants. And then the oldest ants are the ones that go out foraging for food that often find their way into our indoor spaces uninvited. Uh, those workers are out looking for food source. They are looking for primarily sweets, which maintains the workers. They're already adults, so they don't really need a lot of protein to keep them going. They just need the carb as a fuel. But they do need to carry proteins back into the nest where those are fed to the tiny little ants and the brood that are developing and making new tissues. And they find that in, term, in oils and seeds and other scavenging on living or dead insects indoors. They carry that food back to the nest where they feed the immature ants and then the, the uh, colony continues to grow and develop. And so ants are often found outdoors, but they shoot into our living spaces, into our indoor environments, uh, often to find a particular kind of food. And they will find a wide variety of different kinds of foods, sweets and proteins in our environment. The third group I wanted to talk about are flies. And we deal with, uh, we are trained and capable, very capable of dealing with flies. There are about, uh, there are many, many pest flies here in North America. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of flies worldwide in different environments. They're one of the largest insect groups. And so it's not surprising that many of them would have found a way to adapt to our indoor space. Uh, there are some that are aquatic, some that only live on land. They all go through full uh, change in form with the pupil stage. And uh, there are a variety of different biologies. Some only live outdoors, others only inside. Others will venture from outdoors to indoors and pass back and forth. And so there are a wide variety of fly pests that we're trained and capable of dealing with here at Sprague. Most flies, because of their winged forms, are highly mobile and very adaptable and they will occupy various locations within our indoor environments. Um, 
they're a source of annoyance, disgust for some people. Some people are afraid. And uh, anytime you have flies flying around your customers, it can damage your reputation. The impression they get is that something's not clean. Um, flies are attracted to a variety of different breeding sites where they lay their eggs. They're attracted to feces, trash cans, and they'll pick up the filth and germs that are in those locations. And the next thing they land on, now those bacteria have been transferred. And uh, this isn't even to count those flies that actually can bite, suck our blood, and transmit medically important diseases like malaria, encephalitis, yellow fever. Uh, there are a variety of other insect uh, flies, uh, diseases transmitted by this group. So a little bit about flies. Um, flies are motivated by food. Cockroaches aren't proud, they're just hungry. Well, flies are just hungry and will go to food above anything else. That's their number one motivation. After food, they'll, they go to light is the next most powerful motivator, then mating, and then finally temperature. Food odors are very attractive to them and they can detect them over long distances. And uh, this is usually one of the stimuli that brings them into our indoor environments. Uh, once they're at a food source, that's where they find their mates. That's where, they, uh, where their biology and life cycle really is focused is on that feeding site. And they will lay eggs there. And then once those eggs hatch into little maggots, the maggots feed at that feeding site. And then before pupating, they like to, to, to uh, migrate away from that food source and then pupate in a dry protected location somewhere away. Temperature, as I mentioned, is an important stimulus for them. This is another way that flies find their way into our indoor environments. Um, at short distances, they can detect really slight changes in temperature, and they will follow that temperature change into cracks and crevices and find their way into our indoor environments rather easily, whether it's an open door or whether it's a closed door that has gaps around it. You can see in this picture on the top left, the same house uh, taken uh, a regular photo and one with infrared. The red areas show that warm air leaking out around certain features of that home. And flies prefer uh, intermediate temperatures in the low 80s. They'll, when it's cool outside, they'll enter these areas that are showing red here. They'll go to those areas, find that they can detect the, the flow of air coming out through that crack and they will move up that airstream into the indoor environment. If you just switch it, this picture was obviously taken in the cool part of the year when the inside of the home was being heated. But if you flipped it and it was now the, the hot time of the season, we took the same picture, you'd see that there, was cool, there would be cool air leaking out of those same areas that are red. And the flies are able to detect that during the hot times of the year, they prefer to find the cool air leaks and follow those inside. The final group that we'll talk about are rodents. Um, this is a, a, uh, the order rodentia, which means to gnaw. There are almost 500 species of rodents in the United States, but three major pest species, the house mouse, the Norway rat, and the roof rat. Uh, they get their name to gnaw, you know, their gnawing name because of their propensity to chew. And they're constantly chewing, sharpening their teeth that are always growing and uh, they will chew on a wide variety of items and damage many of our, the, the things that we keep in our indoor spaces. Rodents are also known for having very high reproductive rates and being territorial. And they're often associated with transferring and transmitting diseases. Um, their importance as, pet, as pests extends not only just in terms of being unsightly, but or in damaging your reputation when someone sees a rodent in, in your um, business or indoor, uh, look in your indoor environment. But these things sometimes can lead to legal issues and be more, much more serious and cost money. They, uh, because rodents are known to damage food products, to leave their fur dropping in urine on surfaces that they can contaminate areas where food is prepared, uh, in, in addition, as I already mentioned, their gnawing, their burrowing, their chewing can create damage to doors and ceilings, to pipes, and to electronics. Uh, we've even come across situations where car lots are 
having problems with rodents chewing the, the wires in the engines. So a wide variety of different possible damages that can result from these pests, which are very common. Rodents, as I mentioned, can transmit diseases. I wanna point out that they do not transmit COVID or SARS. Uh, sometimes there's a question about that. They are not able to transmit those viruses. However, they do transmit other viruses and bacteria. Some are associated with vectors like fleas that feed on the rodent and bite us and transmit a disease organism. In other times, it's just other situations, it's simply um, the contamination from, from being in a dirty environment and bringing those dirty organisms, those filth organisms out onto our surfaces where we come into contact with it. Sometimes it can be fatal, uh, as in the case of hantavirus, as we see in the picture on the left, where in some of the West, in many of the Western states, uh, this is a virus that's found in the in rodent feces in a particular uh, species of rodent, and inhaling that as it you know when we're trying to clean up these rodent droppings can lead to serious complications and sometimes even death. Uh, in addition, things like salmonella, plague, typhus, and dysentery often result. Rodents have a, an amazing reproductive potential. They multiply rapidly. Mice and rats can produce many new young in each litter. And those litters can happen anywhere from a few weeks you know, to a, a couple of months. And so you get populations that can develop rapidly if they're not managed and taken care of and monitored on a regular basis. And that's one of the services that we provide. Rodents display a wide variety of behaviors. They're not uh, just robots, they adapt. They're, they've even been called smart. Uh, they can be shy, uh, but may, because of their nighttime activities, you'll, uh, they, they are often considered to be reclusive. But what, when they're active, they are active in a variety of situations. They nest indoors. They're able to travel both in and out. Uh, they will climb walls. Uh, we've seen my scale walls, uh, two-story brick walls. They will swim. They establish territories and have family groups that, uh, that interact in a certain area. So these movements, these behaviors, the things that they do in terms of finding food, nibbling on food, feeding, and then producing the, uh, you know, the urine and the feces that they do, these are all things that we're very, uh, our technicians are very well versed in, very trained to handle and do an excellent job of managing. Well, the, the, the trends in, on, in the world right now is that the world is becoming more urbanized, which means there are more indoor spaces than ever. Humans are living more in situations where they share walls with neighbors, whether it's their business or their home. And the businesses that share walls often share pests. And so it's almost unavoidable to interact with each other and to interact with these pests in these, what we call sacred indoor spaces. People often wanna know, what is it? Will it hurt me? And how do I get rid of it? These are the three main questions. And we here at Sprague are trained and very competent and, and know the answers to these questions for a wide variety of different pests, not just those groups I've talked about today, but many others. And I've kind of given a brief introduction into what they are and how they might hurt us. And I'm gonna give the, the microphone back to Shane Hart to talk a little bit about what we at Sprague do to, to get rid of these issues and these worries. Okay, thank you, Dr. House. Today, what I wanna talk about uh, following up on Dr. Hausman's uh, presentation is, is to discuss our approach to the pest solutions during the pandemic. And, and really I wanna cover three different scenarios that commercial properties find themselves in today. And the first one being the proper, uh, a property that is closed. Uh, the second one being a property that has remained open throughout the pandemic. And then thirdly, the, uh, a closed property, but now is ready to reopen. And so as we, uh, as we look at protecting a closed building. We try to understand really what's going on in this empty building. It's got less human interaction. Um, the there's a change in the food source, which, which really is a big impact. 
people are working from home more and more uh, nowadays. Buildings are unattended uh, and really pests are undisturbed for the most part. And, and while we leave them undisturbed and, and kind of take the human element out of their daily lives, their food and water sources have changed. And we've seen this cause shifts in movements of pests uh, where rodents, for instance, may go out, might be seen outdoors more uh, because their food source is no longer there. Um, more and more often we're, we're, we're getting calls about rodent sightings in the middle of the day where normally they would be active at night, but now they're out scavenging uh, and looking for food because a lot of what humans bring to a building um, is what supports their lives. Their lives. So, um, and then there's also flies and roaches. You know, we've seen those emerge inside. It could be from uh, dried up drains or uh, left behind sanitation or structural issues from when a uh, from from when doors were shut. And so, when we talk about the service, um, it's always going to start with a thorough inspection. And this will be a common theme throughout uh, throughout my slides and the different approaches that we take. It always starts with a good inspection inside. You want, we're looking for rodent droppings, dead and live insects to evidence, um, and really any conducive conditions that could support rodent or insect uh, populations. Outside, we're going to focus more on dumpster areas, any kind of garbage receptacles, and we're going to be taking a look at the vegetation around the building and look for any easy access for, uh, for pests. Um, the obvious ones that we're always looking at as we walk around are doors and windows. Um, those are, you know, front of mind, but we also, you know, really want to focus on things like plumbing that goes into the building from the outside or, uh, you know, electrical conduits, places that ants and specifically throughout uh, our, our Sprague's entire footprint, um, you know, we are in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Colorado, Utah, California, Nevada, um, all of these areas, you think about odorous house ants, and they love following these guidelines into buildings. Um, and so with the inspection, we, we're going to combine, um, we're going to combine those inspections with strategic monitoring programs. And what we really are trying to do here is, is help tell a story, give us a story every time we're, we're servicing uh, one of one of your buildings um, as to what evidence we find. We can, we can look at one single sticky trap, for instance, and we can get a pretty good story from that. Um, things, uh, population sizes, how close are we to the actual nest? How old the population might be, depending on what life stages we find, what directions they're coming from. Um, and then also combining that with rodent monitoring, where we use multiple different types of electronic uh, sensors and, and monitor, monitoring devices. Um, uh, we also will, can use non-toxic bait blocks um, and then traps as well to track rodent pressures and activity and see what's happening. You know, when those lights are turned off, uh, there's very little human traffic going through. Um, there's a lot to be said about what's going on in the, uh, the other 22 or 23 hours of the day. Um, so that's, that's what our monitoring uh, program uh, is really geared towards. When we look at service treatments uh, around these options for closed buildings, uh, you know, we don't drastically change what's in our toolbox already, uh, but we look at options uh, in an unoccupied building that might have been logistically difficult, perhaps, uh, with a full workforce uh, in play and operations running as they normally are. Uh, for instance, you know, take mass trapping. Um, you, if you have a rodent infestation, mass trapping combined with interior rodent baiting and maybe pre-baiting some of the traps um, can be really, really effective in controlling a population uh, of rodents. But when you have a building that's in full operation, that can be difficult um, because, you know, rats are neophobic. And when you have to go in every morning and remove the traps or uh, remove the, the bait or whatever you have out, because you can't just have that out during uh, normal business hours, it doesn't allow them to get used to used to the new traps, the new the new things that are in their environment. So 
taking advantage of situations like those where if it's shut down, we can go and really kind of explore all of the options we have. Fogging might be another good example of this where normally if, if you're gonna be fogging a building, you're looking at shutting down operations for a, at least temporarily for a certain amount of time. And you know, quite frankly, that might be the most expensive part of the whole process, not necessarily the, the fogging service, but the fact that you're losing that, that production that you're normally doing throughout the day. So really just exploring all of the different options we have uh, and taking advantage of a building that's being closed and, and where operations might, uh, you know, might make things difficult. Uh, so next, we're going to talk about protecting your buildings and tenants when they're open. So you've got people in the building to some capacity. Maybe it's a full workforce, uh, partial workforce. Um, you may or may not have patrons there. Regardless, this is the case where being able to have your doors open uh, in the building is, is going to be key to the businesses in their success. And when we think about the service uh, in this situation, safety, certainly of, of staff and uh, any patrons that would come to come to the building, um, are p and the peace of mind are really high uh, and top of mind for us. Minimal operational interruption um, is going to be key here to staying pest free, uh, which ultimately really is the goal in all situations. Uh, we've seen countless times over the last 11 months uh, a business or a facility shut down because of positive cases of, of, of COVID or um, even just workforce disruption due to COVID concern. And so but protecting ongoing disinfecting services have really helped keep tenant staffing healthy. Ultimately, um, it allows um, businesses to um, feel good, feel confident about, confident about bringing their workforce back, uh, back to the building. At the same time, um, we also have done a lot of emergency type work where there has been uh, businesses shut down due to positive cases, in which case uh, we can quickly turn that around and uh, oftentimes in the same day, same night, be out there and you know, certify that your building um, or your space has been disinfected and is safe to come back. And we really try and minimize the amount of time that you have to shut down your operations. So thirdly, uh, the, the third scenario here uh, that I wanted to talk about is, you know, so you've been closed for 10 months and, uh, and now you're ready to reopen. And so <clears throat> there are a lot of things, uh, I don't need to tell anybody on this uh, webinar, there's a ton of things that, that go into enabling that to happen, to getting ready to, to open back up. And pest control is just one of them. So the building's about to be re reoccupied. Many things have uh, been put on hold possibly, different vendors, different services. And, and so what Sprague really looks at is we look at this as a fresh start as, and as part of the process and either a new pest provider or a current pest provider, we see that um, it's, it's our responsibility from a pest perspective uh, to help ensure you and your staff and people that it's a, uh, uh, you're coming back to a, um, that to, you're coming back to a building where the pests are being taken care of, where it's safe to come back and start, uh, start operating your business again. Commercial facility closures during COVID-19 have, have uh, led to increases in rodent and insect pressures. Um, that everything that we've seen has shown that. They might be different, um, diluting to uh, what we were talking about before. Maybe the rodents have changed a little bit in your they might be more seen on the outside than on the inside. Uh, maybe some of the uh, other insects are being seen in different areas, just depending on where food sources and harborages are, but there's no doubt that those pressures are still there. Um, and so when with service on uh, a fresh reopening, again, we always want the first step to be a thorough inspection inside and out of the exterior uh, perimeter. Uh, uh, inside and out and the exterior perimeters where we start, um, where we look around the building, dumpsters, garbage areas, uh, any of the vegetation, 
that would be surrounding the buildings inside really focusing on interior kitchens bathrooms common areas office space and uh, pest vulnerable areas uh, next we need to install the monitoring devices. And this is very similar to what I uh, was covering before in a closed location. Um, think of areas where pests would be attracted, you know, appliances, mop sinks, water heaters, refrigerators, places that might have motors, that places that have warmth, moisture, shelter, dark areas, and really deploying a ton of monitoring to, again, tell us that story of what's going on, what's been going on over the last 10 months. Because um, in reality, there's going to be a lot of catch up that's, that, that needs to be done if it's been sitting there unchecked for that long. We've also often found in, in empty buildings that have drains um, that they've, they've tended to dry up if they weren't maintained. And, uh, this can leave an open path and, and cause an emergence in flies, uh, roaches, and, and even in some cases, depending on where your buildings might be, uh, even rodents that could come up from uh, the sewers. And in this case, what we want to do is we want to treat the drains. And so by doing that, we're going to help kill uh, the flies that that uh, would be breeding in those uh, down the pipes, uh, as well as filling those pea traps. And, and what that's gonna do is it's gonna help kind of stop that foul odor that might come up uh, and any other pests that might find their way uh, up into that space. So after we've, that we've done the inspection, uh, we've done treatments as needed. Um, we're also documenting all of this um, very closely. And, and so we wanna give to you that assurance and that confidence that it's a, you can come back to a, a safe place to work and your tenants can come back and their staff can come back and feel good about uh, being in the workspace again. Um, so, this is all documented, um, very detailed, and uh, at that time is where we would dis, uh, we would um, schedule out any follow up uh, services that are deemed necessary based on what is found uh, in your space. Truly, our intent uh, with this with this reopening is to ensure property managers, business owners, um, business managers, and, and you know people that have staff that they that rely on them that their that their space is a safe and healthy place uh, to come back and return to work. So that is what I have today. I want to thank everybody uh, for your time today. And now we're going to uh, open up the Q&A questions box. So if you have any questions, please feel free to enter those in here. And it, it looks like we've got uh, five so far. And I will just go down the list and, and uh, answer them uh, as they were entered. So the first, uh, the first question is, if my building has been vacant for over 10 months, should I be worried about pests? Um, so I, I don't, uh, the last thing I would want to do is, is cause any undue concern or worry. Uh, but I do, I do think that it's smart to have a professional come in and do an inspection. Um, that's a long time to, to, have, uh, to have your building you know, sitting there vacant or kind of unchecked. So I would recommend having a pest professional do an inspection, both inside and out. Um, you know, they are trained to identify insects, uh, spot evidence of rodents, and also come up with action plan steps uh, to remediate whatever is found out there. Um, okay. Let's see, what pests have been the most active during COVID-19 shutdowns? Well, in, um, in our experience here, um, and it, you know, it would be possibly, it, it could be different around our whole territory as I, as I listed before, we have uh, much of the Western uh, United States um, now. Up in the Northwest, I would say rodents have been the most common. Um, the reports have shown that when the food sources have been removed from the building, um, that the rats have kind of followed or, or been scavenging and looking for them. So we've seen a lot more of them uh, on the outdoors. And so especially with outdoor dining now and, um, you know, 
we're seeing an uptick there. We're seeing more feeding in our in our bait stations, which ultimately is a good thing because it's helping control the population overall. Um, but rodents would be uh, the most probably the most uh, the most active pest that we've seen since the shutdown. They're they're more they're out there more daring. As I said before, they're they're out in the day a lot more than they than they were before. You, you, um, they're just a little bit more. Um, they're looking for food because because they don't have it. We're not giving them what they need on a normal basis like we were before. Okay, what are the best ways to stop flies from and uh, from entering interior of the property? Uh, so I think there's a couple, a couple things. Exclusion. Um, I would start with uh, there. So see, making sure all of the doors and windows are are sealed. Um, if you've got screens on your windows, make sure that they're well fit into the uh, window frames, and um, that'll be a good way to exclude the flies. Make make sure your garbage areas and receptacles are in good condition. Um, often, you know, if you have if there's been any disruption to your trash pickup um, or any kind of you know normal maintenance that you had before, you want to make sure that you don't have overflowing trash or things that are going to attract rodents and flies um, from all over the place. Uh, keep those trash keep those trash containers you know at least 20 feet away from any entryways. Um, and then also, uh, as I talked about before, is is clean drains and, and not letting them dry out. Um, when those pea traps dry out, flies can go in there and they can they can breed and, and that's where the, when there's no uh, water in the pea traps, there's nothing to stop them from breeding in there and then coming into your into your space. Okay. Let's see what are some easy tips that I can share with the tenants? Uh, to look for a pest problem. Uh, so, you know, looking at structural guidelines inside for insect trails and rodent droppings, um, that's typically where a lot of uh, pests are going to follow those structural guidelines and you're going to see evidence. Um, you know, you can always open up unused equipment and look for, for nesting material and appliances. Keep an eye out on the vegetation too outside. Um, keep, make sure that. It, um, you know, you don't have trees overhanging onto the buildings. Um, the key here is really not to ignore these signs. So the longer that they're, they are let to linger um, and that pests uh, start to show up, the harder it is, the more work goes into actually taking care of them once we do um, put a plan in place. So when you see something, the key is to um, act on it call a professional, get somebody there to help identify the problem and inspect the premises. Let's see, if I'm doing my own walkthrough of my building, what are some key signs that I should look for to know if I need to call my pest provider? Um, so, Again, you're going to look for rodent droppings, um, any kind of insects, live, dead ones. Um, you know, if you see a group of flies hovering around, um, that's a good sign. Plus, if you see a lot of dead insects uh, lying around, uh, that's that's a pretty good sign as well. Uh, be aware of the, you know, just be aware of things and, uh, you know, use your use your senses. If something smells weird, something smells odd, that's off, um, you know, keep, it could be stinky drains, it could be dead animals, um, you know, keep that in mind when you're, when you're doing your walkthroughs of your buildings. Obviously, look, you know, using your site to look around and um, look for certain things is, is going to be natural is what you're going to do. And then also um, listening to things. If you're hearing noises that aren't normal to the you know, regular function of the building or the space you're in, that can also be a sign that maybe you have rodents in the ceiling or um, you know, carpenter ants in the walls. There's, uh, you, you, wanna, you wanna listen, you wanna, you wanna smell, and you wanna use your eyes and just uh, be aware. And when you see something that seems um, odd, out of whack, um, call a professional.
Okay. Is it necessary to have a corrective action if one rodent is found in an, in an inside catch-all in the course of one year time period? Um, that's a good question. So um, I, it is, I, I think it's ne necessary to have a corrective action. Um, one rodent means that it, it, it must have come in some way. So I think that there needs to be an inspection and an investigation um, from, from the get go of how that one got in. Now, it, that doesn't mean that there's a major population inside, but it's still gonna, um, it's still good to investigate how it possibly could have gotten in. So it could be a simple structural fix that you would find um, that can be taken care of. Um, but in that investigation, it will also open up a whole, you know, it could open up a lot more and you might find a lot of other, uh, you might find other evidence telling you different. So um, starting with that inspection and investigation um, is, is definitely um, going to be important. And through that, um, you can develop what your corrective action is going to be. So it might be adding a door sweep to a door, or it might be fixing a hole in a wall. Um, but that inspection is gonna tell you what your corrective action should be. Good question. Uh, okay, uh, considering cockroaches often come into, the, into areas on personal items from an employee's home, do you or, or doctor have a good suggestion for training employees on pest management in their homes, considering many people are sensitive about their dwellings. Uh, Dr. Hausman, do you uh, want to take that one? Sure, I can do that, Shane. Um, this is a, an excellent question because uh, sometimes the source of an infestation is an employee's home and it can be a threat uh, when they bring those from their home. And as you pointed out, um, this is a sensitive topic as well, because anytime we're talking about that sacred space, whether it's you know, in a positive or if it's in a negative way, especially people can have their feelings hurt. So I think any kind of, you mentioned any suggestions about training, I think training should be done as a general training. Uh, you, you don't wanna single anyone out. You don't want anyone to feel that there's, the, that they're the source of an infestation for an entire company. But this ought to be, a, anytime you're, you're giving a training and you're talking about this at work, you, this ought to be stressed as an important link, that uh, transporting them from home to the business or from the business back home, uh, either direction this transport happens is a serious uh, thing that, that can happen and is a, re a realistic source of infestation. So. What we always want to do is, is stress the importance of making sure that food and other kinds of uh, a variety of different food sources are clean before someone goes to bed at night. You know, leaving a sink full of dishes with food on them. If the food's rinsed off, then obviously the dishes can sit there. But, you know, managing food waste is a really important thing. Taking out the indoor trash can every evening so that that trash can isn't sitting indoors full of food for roaches to feed on. Any kind of available food that, that sits out overnight is a perfect uh, thing to mention and to encourage employees to remedy and it can be easily remedied. Um, also talking about the areas of their home where they where these roaches will hang out, making sure they understand that kitchens behind, in the kitchen under the sink, behind the stove, behind the refrigerator, places where it's warm and moist. The bathrooms uh, are the key areas where they wanna make sure that food and other resources are not left out overnight. So those were a few of the tips I would give is to make sure that employees understand that there really is a link first that they can be transported. Second, that uh, you know the areas in a home where food and, and moisture and warmth come together are key target areas. And finally, reminding them to not leave food out overnight, uh, whether it's in the sink, on dirty dishes, on the table, because it hasn't been cleared off, or whether the trash can is full of trash overnight. And uh, those will be a good start. 
and uh, in helping employees understand um, cockroach basics for their home. Anything to add, Shane? No, I think that was uh, I think that was great. Thank you, Doctor. Um, all right, we've got one more question, uh, and it is: What qualities and capabilities should I look for when choosing a pest control provider? Um, another great question. Um, I will answer that uh, in a couple different ways, um, but. but <clears throat> When I think of uh, of a pest control provider, that um, I, I I would look for somebody that is extremely thorough and really focused on problem sol solving and finding the source of of the issues, um, and and following that up with being a, a good communicator. Um, and so, part of uh, being a good a, a good partner, and that that might be a great way to sum up uh, who would be a good provider for you. Um, somebody who is a partner in helping you run your business safely and effectively by kind of taking that pest uh, that that pest side of of your business um, out of your mind and, and being the professional to take care of it for you, and um, then communicating um, what needs to be communicated um, clearly and uh, you know letting you know exactly what's going on in your building but but working with you to help solve issues um, because a partnership really in in at least in my experience having a good partnership between um, the business owner or the business manager and the pest control company is where um, is where we are most most successful on both sides um, I would also put in their documentation at this, you know, at this day and age, documentation is becoming more and more important for our clients. And so you, you're going to want um, somebody that can provide you very detailed information about what they did, what they, what they saw, uh, what they recommend, um, you know, what they used, what types of, uh, you know, what types of chemicals, what kind of, what types of mechanical tools, what what their approach is and what they did, um, both for your knowledge, but also just for, um, you know, in the world, you know, where we're at today, documentation is key. And so to, to be able to have that detailed information at your fingertips is going to be very important. So um, you're going to want somebody that can provide that for you. Um, Dr. Hausman, would you have anything to add to that? No, I agree. I think uh, someone who's responsive who, uh, when there is an issue, someone who communicates well what they saw each time they're there and provides a, a solid summary of, of activity, and someone who is a partner, as you mentioned, I think those are key things, and and uh, those are some those are some of the main strengths that our technicians show. They keep good records, they communicate frequently, and they are very responsive and work with partners. All right. Well, we have uh, one more question that came in. Uh, I have noticed that roaches like to live in sewers and we are currently working to treat ours. Does Sprague have an effective sewer treatment that would be approved by the city's sewer master? I am looking for a good product that kills roaches or makes them not want to go down a, tr a trunk line. Application method would be great as well. Um, so when it comes to city and sewer lines, um, I'm not uh, sure what city we're in right uh, is being uh, that you are from, uh, but there is definitely certain restrictions, regulations around that. So it's, it's hard to answer that without uh, knowing exactly where we're talking about, because there is, there is, uh, there, there would need to be some um, kind of research on that to make sure that uh, what was being done was was certainly was approved by the city. Um, let's see. I would I would add um, in terms of when we're talking about sewer lines, we can there are a few roaches a few roach species that will use sewers, uh, primarily the Oriental cockroach here in North America, but could be the American roach. And one of the things we often will do is uh, make those 
sewers inaccessible by using screening to minimize the roaches going in and out of those. And those roaches, those two roaches also will be responsive to uh, some of the baits. And so sometimes it's not even necessary to put anything down the drain. If you can seal, if you can screen the drain and then there are a variety of roach bait products, which are the gold standard for roach control. Our roach control programs are based on baits, not on temporary sprays. And, and those baits have much longer lasting impacts. And so whether you're using Advion, Max Force, OptiGuard or Vendetta, there are a variety of different bait products that work very well on a variety of roaches. But, uh, but we, we, here at Sprague, we always focus on um, non-chemical strategies as a foundation, and then we work towards using chemical strategies to augment that. And so any kind of strategy with roaches in the sewers would want to start with some kind of a, um, a uh, screening to, to minimize that travel into and out of sewers. All right, thank you, doctor. Well, uh, that is all the questions we uh, have today. I wanna thank everybody for uh, joining the webinar. If you have any ad additional questions, uh, you can contact uh, marketing at spraypest.com. Uh, but thank you all and uh, have a great day.